Hi, Joy Horner here, independent midwife, and today we're going to talk about looking after your private parts throughout pregnancy and birth and postnatally. So we are going to use anatomical terms, we're also going to use common terms, because lots of people have lots and lots of different names for their lady parts. So let's start by getting some of those out of the way. So front bottom, tuppence, frou-frou, fandango, um, what did I hear it called once? A flu, um, fanny, pussy, cunt, all of those things. Yeah, there's many, many, many more. Um, we'll also use vagina and vulva and labia, depending which bits we're talking about. Now, this is really important because we don't tend to talk about our lady bits. I certainly don't talk about mine <laughs> and I don't expect you to do likewise. Um, unless we're in a, a pregnancy or birth situation and you need me to know about your vagina or fanny or whatever else you'd like to call it. So <laughs> this is all about self-care. This isn't about what I can do as a midwife or what your doctor can do or your gynecologist. This is about you and your relationship with your body. So I've got a couple of props here which I absolutely love. So we'll be using this little sweet thing which Sarah Wickham makes They're in her Etsy shop. I'm sure you can look them up little yoni there um and i've also got this lovely <laughs> lovely crocheted um hairband thing which i love i wear this but yeah it's really good to show stretchiness and stuff like that uh, and i often think perhaps i'm not good at explaining things so i like visual props um, and I really liked it when I did my National Childbirth Trust antenatal teacher training because um, I got to make and use lots and lots of props. So I'll be trying to do a bit of that, although I've got nowhere to put my phone. So I don't know how I'm going to do it one handed, but we'll see. So not everyone knows their body. Not everyone has had a look down there. Not everyone knows that their parts are normal. So if you haven't looked at your parts at all, I'd suggest getting a mirror, having a look and getting to know what's normal for you. And yes, it's all probably normal. It really doesn't matter about the size of your lips or, or the colour of it or anything else. And often the colour changes in pregnancy. You know, the inner vaginal walls can, can take on like a, um, yeah, a sort of lilac hue. They, they can look a little bit darker and sometimes the outside darkens a little. Um, so, yeah, yeah, things to look forward to if you're pregnant. <laughs> things do change down there. And the whole point of doing this is to let you know what the normal is so that you can detect the abnormal if it happens. So if you know what your normal looks like, you're aware of what your normal discharge looks like, you'll notice if there's something different and you can get it looked at if you need to or not treat it yourself so changes during pregnancy as i've said it can change color a bit it can get a bit darker um, and most people get much more discharge and this is to do with the the hormones of pregnancy you know everything gets a little bit more nice and slippy slidey ready for baby to come out because it's a baby shoot after all isn't it you know you want your baby to use it like a, a water slide you want it to be nice and slippy for your baby just to go whoosh <laughs> and come down if only that were the case say hey, whoosh um it is it is in some births it is possible um yeah so discharge is is a normal thing it's a, a way that your vagina keeps itself clean so it produces lots and lots of stuff and it literally washes itself all the time. That's what discharge is. And most people notice it as white, creamy, doesn't really smell of anything in particular. <laughs> Thank you, whoever that was. I haven't got my glasses on. If you want to comment, please comment along the way. I may forget stuff, so please chip in. Um, yeah, yeah, so it's normally a sort of whitey, creamy, and it increases as pregnancy goes on. And it's called leucorrhea, which sounds like gonorrhea, doesn't it? It sounds 
<laughs> Sounds like something nasty, but it's not. It's just the normal white discharge that happens in pregnancy. Now, another white discharge that can happen in pregnancy, of course, is thrush, a yeast infection. And if you've never had a yeast infection before, there's no doubting it when you have one because things get really, really uncomfortable, really sore, really itchy. And if you have a look, there are white deposits all around your yoni. If you have a look at your vulva and just inside your vagina, there's lots of sort of white bits, white lumps, and the discharge is sort of lumpy white stuff coming away. It might smell a bit yeasty. Um, and you can get easy treatment for that. You know, if you go to your local pharmacy, tell them you're pregnant and say, you know, you've got a thrush infection and, you know, you'd like some treatment. There are other types of discharge. So if your discharge is ever green or yellow or smells really bad, that's something that actually needs to go off to the lab and have a test because we, we need to know if it's an infection that needs treatment. Um, you know, it could be a bacterial infection. Um, yeah, so you need you need that looked at. <laughs> and it's not uncommon, you know, people get infections everywhere in their body. Shouldn't be a source of embarrassment. You know, we all get bugs everywhere, don't we? Um, but yeah, ask your midwife to have a look if you're not sure, if you're pregnant. Say, can you have a look at this? And she can often take a swab and just send it off to the lab just for peace of mind. And quite often it's just the normal leucorrhea, as I said, just a normal white discharge. Um, yeah, so pregnancy progresses and your body gets ready to give birth. So everything becomes more and more stretchy. And it's it's amazing what our bodies can do. And again, we don't know what our bodies can do, do we? If they've not done it before and we've not looked down there and we've not um, felt, you know, how, how stretchy things can be down there, um, how are we going to believe that we're going to stretch in labour? You know, and we've got this tiny little, tiny little opening there. Um, how's a baby going to come through that? Well, quite amazing actually because it's elastic and like men's parts our parts are elastic too but because it's internal we can't see how they stretch we can't see how stretchy they are and I attended a wonderful conference once where Ina Mae Gaskin was talking and, and she used the the most fantastic visual image for this she said have you ever stood behind a cart horse when it poops <laughs> And you've seen its anus go from that to that and then back again. That's what our bodies do. They're amazing. Men's parts go from that to that and back again. You know, our bodies can do it. Our, you know, our frou-frou, our little flower can go from that to huge. <laughs> I can't really show you with one hand. It's really stretch and back again. Um, but you don't know this unless perhaps you've had a feel yourself. So... I do suggest perineal massage in pregnancy. You can do it whenever, but there's no point in starting it right at the start. It's better to, to do it when you're really, really stretchy at the end of pregnancy and your hormones, you know, they've done all the stretching anyway. <clears throat> and all you're doing in perineal massage is getting to know that part of your body and getting to know that it does stretch. And apparently it can reduce the severity of perineal tearing. And I think it only does this because we get prepared for the sensations of stretching. So if you're used to stretching your yoni with perineal massage, when it comes to the point when baby's head is crowning and you feel that stretching, you're not going to go, oh, my God, what's that? You know, <laughs> that feels really strange. Um, yeah, you're just going to go, OK, I know that's stretching and I know I can relax and breathe into it. And it will be a whole new broadcast if I start talking about perineal massage. But I suggest linking it to lovemaking. And it doesn't matter if you've got a partner or not got a partner. The point is to get your oxytocin really, really high. So that part of your body relaxes and it engorges with blood in the same way that, that men's parts do. Um, you must know, you know, if if ever you felt really turned on you know you're with your husband or partner of your dreams and you know you feel really turned on and really hot down there that's because the area is getting engorged with blood isn't it and becoming more stretchy 
and more easy to open. And it's the same in childbirth. Although most of us don't feel sexy or turned on in childbirth. Um, but you can get to a high mental state where you are totally filled with oxytocin and your body can do the same thing. You know, so if you link your perineal massage to love making, again, when you get to that point of pushing your baby out, you know, perhaps your brain will recognise it as pleasure rather than pain. And perhaps, yeah, perhaps you'll even have an orgasmic birth. That's possible. I had a friend and she had an orgasmic birth with a forceps birth. Can you imagine? There, there we are. Yeah, it's just possible. Everything's possible. Right, and I do go off at a tangent, don't I? I've got a little list here. It's like a little shopping list. It's what I <laughs> what I think of first thing in the morning. What pops into my head? Oh, let's talk about vaginas and yonis and all the rest of it. Um, yeah, so that was perineal massage. And you don't need oil to do it, okay? I've never met anyone dry in pregnancy. Most pregnant women are really juicy down there. And yeah, you use your own juices. You know, unless you've just come out of the bath and you've washed yourself squeaky clean. Um, <laughs> hi, Maria. Hi, Michelle. Um, yeah, you know, you, sh you shouldn't need any oil. You can use oil, you know, if it makes you feel better, if it's easier to do that way. But yeah, just use what's there, I say. Um, yeah, and then we've got to talk about perineal um, pelvic floor exercises. Because most of us know about pelvic floor exercises. Sorry, I'm slouching and uh, injured my back yesterday. And it's not good to slouch. Oh, <laughs> yeah, pelvic floor exercises. So most of us know how to tighten, don't we? You know, you imagine the bit that you're sitting on and you imagine tightening it up and holding it and then letting it go again. And we do this in cycles. So you can tighten and hold as long as you can hold you know and then release you can also do the the fast twitch muscles which are tight and release tight and release tight and release you know do the two of them together but what you're doing is just making your muscle tight 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 you know if you imagine i don't know your biceps or something and you're just tighten 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 you know we also need to relax particularly as we need to know how to relax to let our babies out so Hi there, birthing glorious doula. <laughs> so look at people like um, Katie Bowman, um, who talk about stretching your pelvic floor muscles by squatting. And it's not the usual squat. It is squatting as if you're going to have a pee outdoors and you don't want to get your shoes wet. So you keep your knees over your feet, you stick your bum out and you pee backwards and that stretches your pubococcygeus muscle. So instead of just tightening, 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 it gives it a nice stretch. And you need to know how to relax it too. And you can do this with simple breathing. So if you breathe in and then breathe out, concentrating on the, the sensations with your pelvic floor muscles, you may notice that when you breathe in, towards the end of breathing in, you can feel everything drawing up and tightening. And as you breathe out, you may feel everything relaxing and dropping down. So the breathing out, it's good to practice that maybe if you're on the loo, having a, a bowel action. Breathing out, feeling the pelvic floor, just relaxing and dropping down. And when you do your, pel your pelvic floor exercises, after you've done all your tightening, 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 consciously relax, consciously make sure that you haven't left it in a tense state. So, yeah, I'm really keen on this pelvic floor stuff because it's really important. It's an important part of our body. Um, yeah, and you need to know what it does and how to care for it. Right. Yeah, so that takes us to relaxing and breathing your baby out. So if you're used to breathing and relaxing that part of your body, again, when, when it comes time to baby being birthed, you can breathe out and just let your body do the pushing. You know, you don't need to do all the coached pushing. 
unless there's an emergency of course I have to say this as a midwife I have asked people to push really really hard on a couple of occasions um, but it's not usual um, only if there's a good reason um, episiotomy yeah how to avoid an episiotomy well a really good way to avoid episiotomy is to have a water birth if you're in the pool we can't do an episiotomy end of <laughs> we can't see your perineum um, let alone get get anything near your perineum to do an episiotomy. An episiotomy is a cut in your vaginal opening. We cut between the vagina and the anus which is called the perineum um, to make the opening bigger to let the baby out and I've done one in the past um, yeah 15 years yeah and that was a breech baby and we had real difficulty getting that baby out and it was a last minute um, life or death situation. You know, most breech births aren't like that, I have to say, um, but this one was, so we had to do something. Um, so episiotomies aren't necessary. Sometimes they're necessary. If you have a, a forceps delivery, um, sometimes they can prevent really nasty tears, um, but otherwise, no, no, don't have an episiotomy. Write it on your birth plan that you don't want an episiotomy. Tell your midwife or doctor you don't want an episiotomy. Um, tell them you don't give consent for an episiotomy unless it's a life and death situation. Um, yeah, and do your perineal massage. And yeah, you'll be able to relax those muscles and let your baby out and you won't need an episiotomy. But nobody needs an episiotomy. Oh, for goodness sakes. Ah, as I said, unless it's life and death, and then I think, yes, I'd have one. That's episiotomy with episiotomy. Oh, we haven't talked about tears. So sometimes tears happen during childbirth. You can reduce the need, the, the incidence of tears. Again, by having a pull birth, by doing your pelvic floor massage, not by directed pushing. There are lots and lots of other things. I'll have to do a, a post on that, won't I? avoiding tears um, but basically a lot of people do tear during childbirth um, but it can be anything from a little split in the skin to like a little graze um, to just just a tiny bit of the, the skin again I can't really show you can I I needed to put this on a stand so I could show you on my hand um, the point being that most of these tears heal absolutely fantastically on their own you know limit your movements after birth keep the area really clean you know let let the air get to it now and again don't wear plastic pads you know the um ultra absorbent things use the big old fat maternity pads that are cotton <laughs> you know or cotton baby disposable nappies or yeah something real nice on it um yeah and most of them heal up absolutely fine so don't don't worry about tears the ones we've got to worry about are um, severe tears called obstetric anal sphincter injury tears and they're the ones that tend to happen if you have obstetric interventions so um, forceps, vontus, um, epidural, pushing flat on your back, um, your care provider pulling baby out um, yeah lo lots and lots of other causes for third, third and fourth degree tears although sometimes you know rarely they can just happen of their own accord um, so yeah but most simple tears heal very well sometimes stitches are needed to keep the edges together um, and then they heal really really well um, after birth you will bleed for a few weeks usually um, and that's called lochia um, yeah and your yoni vagina strangely enough goes back really quickly remember the cart horse again you know having its poop and then it returns to normal the same happens after childbirth although you won't feel the strength of your muscles you know things when you look at them you know might look a little bit swollen but they won't look like that after childbirth they'll, they'll go back to their usual <laughs> Um, in the first 24 hours after childbirth, it's vaginal birth, it's not unusual to feel a bit numb down there, to not be able to do your pelvic floor exercises. Um, that's quite normal. Um, as soon as you can do them, do them because it will reduce swelling, it will enc encourage blood flow down there. Um, 
yeah, and strengthen the muscles. And all of us need to do pelvic floor exercises for life. It doesn't matter if you've had a cesarean birth or not even had children. You know, you've got to do these exercises. Oh, and I learned the other day about hypopressive exercises. So do look up hypopressive exercises, um, particularly if you have a bit of bladder leakage as you get older. I mean, it, it doesn't always happen after childbirth. Again, as you get older, you hit menopause, um, all your hormones change and you can get bladder leakage. You can also get things called a prolapse. So if anything... Um, feels dragging heavy in your vagina if you have difficulty having a poo um, yeah if you feel anything coming down in your vagina that could be a prolapse get that looked at but yeah look at hypopressive exercises as it sounds I can't spell it because I'm no good at spelling um, I'll write it later <laughs> look up that because they're really good and may help you avoid surgery you know, doc doctors usually suggest surgery, but I've just come across these great exercises you can do. Um, yeah, which takes us to sex, really, doesn't it? How we all began, you know, how all this pregnancy began, sex. And at some point, you might want to resume lovemaking with your partner. You might not, um, but most people do, you know, <laughs> after a period of time. But it's not unusual not to want to have intercourse for several weeks particularly if you've had stitches or if you've had a, a traumatic birth um, if you've got a very fretful baby very unsettled baby um, you don't get any sleep there's no way you're going to feel up to you know wanting to have sex <laughs> so discuss this with your partner beforehand it can take weeks it can take months and when you do, things can feel a bit dry, depending on what your hormones are doing. Um, so you might have to use a lubricant, something like KY jelly. Um, yeah, yeah. But you can resume it. Some people say sex is better after having babies. Some people say it's worse. Some people say it's no different, you know. Um, but yeah, but you, you shouldn't really have any problems having penetrative sex after you've had a vaginal birth if you do perhaps there's something not quite right perhaps you need to see your doctor or gynecologist and get that checked out but mostly it's absolute tiredness and you know fear that it may hurt the first time um but yeah but you you soon get over that and things heal and can be as good as they ever were so i know that's a big worry for lots of people right i'm going to wrap this up because i've been talking forever um contraception yeah yeah do think about contraception before you have your first period because when you have your first period you've ovulated <laughs> you have already ovulated and that's why you're having a period so you need to look at contraception and midwives are meant to suggest it within 24 hours of birth and i think this is a bit rude actually you know i don't want to suggest it 24 hours after birth you know like people are going to want to have intercourse straight away Ooh, rude no um but yeah definitely talk it over with your midwife maybe after the first week maybe it's because midwives don't see people so often now um, and they want to make sure they tell them while they've got them straight after birth but ooh. <laughs> um yeah i think that's about it yeah so i'll say goodbye my lovely little vulva as I said, Sarah Wickham makes them. You can buy them from her Etsy shop. They're very sweet and you can demonstrate all sorts of things with them. But yeah, so I hope that's been informative. Do put any questions down below and I'll answer them. Yeah, as best I can. So take care. Make friends with your fanny. Your fanny is your friend. And don't let anyone tell you they know more about your fanny than you do, as Nicola Goodall said. <laughs> Take care. Bye.